plan. The head in heaven at the throne and the feet on earth. And you say that you will be on the throne until the earth is made or the enemies, enemies be made your footstool. And so, Lord, we know that there's a lot of spiritual enemies that, we, that, that are encounter us as we go through life. And that we have the strength and power from heaven that has been placed all the way from heaven to earth. And we are part of that. We are the body of Christ. Our body contains the presence of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And within this body that we have is this realm that is a spiritual realm that sometimes is hard to define between the spiritual and the carnal. So I pray that today, Father, you would open the windows of heaven and, and, and allow us to see a spiritual view of how things really are. We go about doing our business and we go about doing our duties from day to day, and it is often it doesn't register with us what all is transpiring or what all uh, you're looking at when you look at us. But when we give it some thought, we think and we know, according to your word, that you are in heaven at the throne and you're receiving our worship. And it's almost like it's part of you worshiping because we're your body. So it's a tremendous gift. It's a tremendous gift, and we bless you for it, that you can give us that power to worship you in spirit and in truth. Be with us today as we go through this word and expound on it, Father, that our, our lives would be enriched, that we would be able to have understanding, and our, our ears would be open, so that we can see how you see it and how things are. We bless you, Father. We pray also that you would allow healing to go out today, even in the middle of this message. Uh, this has been on my heart for about a week, about something about healing today, and haven't been able to understand it completely, but something to do with healing. And I pray, Father, that there would be a flow of healing that would go out into the bodies, into the minds, into the spirit of man, into whatever condition someone is standing before you here, Father, whether it's sickness, whether it's some other thing, I pray that in the name of Jesus, the Yeshua, the Messiah, that your power from heaven would be here upon the earth, in our vessels, in, our, in your body. We are the body of Christ. We are your body. So I pray that there would be a lot of healing today. I pray that the word would go out and it would, it would find lodging in the place where you want it to go. Design your word, Father, so the hear will hear. Make it so that people will hear. And if there is necessities and needs, I pray that somehow it would enfold them that they could contain it, that life would go in reverse from maybe the way it has been going in some people's hearts and lives. I pray that you would put a stop to all the spiritual forces that, that want to ring against us as humans. And we know that we live in this world where, where devils are. We know that evil spirits are amongst uh, places where we walk. We know that we're encountered with a cloud of witnesses. There is many things that we do not see. Many, many, many things that are invisible to us. But we know they're there. We know that the enemy is as a roaring lion seeking, and he is seeking for every last one of us. He is watching us and seeing where he can cause us to stumble or cause us to lose heart. And, and he's looking for any little doorway he can find to somehow make so that our feet become disconnected with our head. But Father, we pray today that in the midst of this, that your truth would remain and your truth would stand strong and that we could see the life that you have given at the cross and at Calvary and where you died and you came out of the grave. And there is plenty of power here for deliverance, for healing, 
for whatever our necessities are. I bless you, Father, for this moment in time, and I pray that more than the information that comes from the message, that ministry would come. It, it's seemingly this kind of a, a morning that I sense it in my heart, tremendous ministry, not having a lot of words for the ministry that does come. So I pray that you might increase that which you have designed for us to receive today. Father, I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Sometimes we have a, a clear message that God gives us and we, we, are, we anticipate giving the message and uh, because we know it was from the Lord. He, he showed us a revelation of truth and we know that, that there's people that um, will receive this and that it will help them. And this morning I can say that it was with a lot of wobbling left and right and however I want to describe that that I've come to this message, and I'm not even sure that as I stand before you, what all God has for us. But I do know and I have confidence in what is in me is, like I said in that prayer, that there is more ministry in me than there is words. And I don't necessarily understand all of that, but I do at times understand how that works. Um, that there is more something that God wants to do through just simply being here by having his presence amongst us than really the uh, vocabulary that I use and the phraseology that I use in putting words together. And uh, I've waffled some with, there's such, been such an outpouring of uh, moving of God from last Sunday. And there's people that have been deeply moved and changed by, by God's presence here last Sunday. And, and I, I thought about having time of testimony and just asking you to come forth and, and, and speak what God has done. What, what has he done this week? I've been hearing all the way until even last night of people that were changed and moved by, by what God was trying to say to us. And so... In the middle of that, uh, I've, come in, I've been into these places before that, um, where I don't know for sure what God is saying. I know what he's saying, but how to deliver that. If you understand what I'm saying, I know, I know what God is saying. I know what God is wanting for us to receive today. But how to deliver it to your hearts is what I'm not sure, whether it is by word or whether it is just simply receiving by being in his presence. And so I trust that God would be able to convey uh, truth that some of you, or maybe all of you, I don't know, but some of you are in, in necessity of, that are really desiring that, that you, know, you see, sometimes we pray for years and we pray for a long time for something, but then one day it happens. And other times we can pray and it happens almost immediately after that. And for some reason this, this message that is on my heart, and when I say on my heart, I'm really referring to the ministry of it. Um, have you ever heard of the term, which we know, we know about because it's in the Bible, that, that he has given to us abundantly and ab beyond abundantly to the point where there is an overflow, something that flows, something that just we can't keep back and flows. That is somewhat what I stand before you this morning. But it almost seems that my words are going to limit what God is wanting to do. And so I would like to invite you to anticipate maybe an answer that you've been looking for from God. Maybe a problem, maybe a, a solution from some, for something that you might have. Maybe it's, and it can, it, it can uh, do with physical things. It can do with financial things. It can do with about anything. And so uh, that, is, that is what is on my heart. And like I say again, I thought, should I just stand before the people and pray, and just pray that God would distribute to that and to release his, his presence and to release that which he has for us or should it be by a message? And so, 
That's why it was easier for me to stand up here with my, just my eyes closed and not even, um, not even, uh, yeah, I just keep my eyes closed and let God do what he wants to do because we ask him to come into our presence. We know he is in our presence. But I will start out with this message and we'll see how the Lord delivers it to us. But I would like for you all to, if you can, uh, in an, on an individual basis, listen to this message, not because that I am giving it, but because it is obvious that God is speaking to necessities that maybe all of you or maybe some of us face, and you're looking for answers. So in that I will start out, and I've simply entitled the message, Milk and Honey milk and honey. And we remember and we know the incident. And, and I, I'll say this, I, I might go down through here and all I want is just cut it short and be done. But I, I, like I say, I, I, there is this thing in me that, that has, uh, and I have faith that there is something in my, uh, that God is wanting to do in individuals' lives. And there's nobody that I have in mind. I have no idea who or if it's everyone. But if you've been seeking God and crying out and calling on God for something maybe for years already or something, listen to what God speaks to you through this word. I know that, I'll say this, that somewhat the basis of this message by way of experience was that many years ago when I was in a real financial difficulties in the early beginnings of our um, of my ministry because I was out preaching the word and that never pays well. And I was so poor. We were so poor. We were completely in poverty and, and uh, we about couldn't survive. And I thought, and it was even, I was even, there was even people that made fun of me because of it and were saying that God's blessing is not with you. And, and uh, because, because I believe in the Holy Spirit and I believe in the, the power of the Word of God, just the way it says. And so they were making fun of me and pointing their fingers and saying that, you know, he has this message about what God can do and the power of God and so forth, but look at his own life that God can't even supply his need. I heard those very words. And against the, the giants in the land that spoke to me and intimidated me tremendously because they were saying some things that were absolute that I was experiencing. And it was a lot of difficulty that I was encountering in the midst of that. My heart was to only do what God wants to do. And if that means to, to go and preach the word so that people can get saved, then I need to do that. And I will do that even if it makes me poor. And at that point, I, I remember giving up one Sunday. I was preaching in a, in a revival uh, tent campaign thing that uh, I just said that I've given up my life to even ever own a home because it seems that what God is using me for, I will always be somebody poor and always, it just seemed that way. And uh, that's the giant that stood in front of me. And then as I was driving down the road one day and I, it was enough that it was affecting my family. In fact, we moved then, at one point we moved and I was so embarrassed for the people to see the furniture that we had. My son, uh, my oldest son, was sleeping on a bed that was built with blocks and boards. And there was not even, we didn't have enough money for a bed frame. And we were embarrassed. I remember one time that I, that I stayed in a, in a revival meeting, I stayed at somebody's home and I saw that all their towels, they matched. And I what I know of what we had at home was big holes in towels and, and, and we never even thought about, I never even, never even occurred to me that things need to match. It was like the whole bathroom was, I think it was green and even the towels were greenish and all this. And, and I thought to myself, oh God, it would really be something if I could supply somehow that my family would also have the fine experiences of something like that rather than being in such extreme poverty. And it was not only in that that I was in a condition of extreme necessity, but there were other things. But it was through that time that many people were being saved. Many people came to know Christ through that time. And 
But it was that one day from, for about a mile down the road from here where I, and I, uh, God started working in me that, that your blessing, the blessing that I will bless you with is nothing you can produce with your hands. And I saw that revelation of that truth. And I, I, I kept asking the Lord to lead me there because I have no understanding. Because I have never, I came from a religious background to where I didn't have that understanding. And uh, the condemnation that was hanging over my head was that if you don't work, you do not eat. And I could only work when I was at home, but when I was on the road preaching, that would have indicated that I was not working. And so I, I, I came under those serious condemnations at time that wanted to rule me and, and, and basically declare the future of my life. And it was several miles down the road one day. Uh, no, not several. It was even probably even less than a mile. Right over here on the next crossroad over, I was driving one, one evening. And I just had my Bible, this very Bible, in my hand. And I, I just said, God, I just, my family is growing up, and I can't even provide for them because, um, and I always felt that it's important for my family to have good memories of their home. So we never told them of the poverty that we were in, and it was later on in life that they were really surprised that we were that poor. They did not know it because we shielded them from that. The other thing is that God is a God of blessing, and yet I wasn't experiencing it. And so there was all kinds of giants that stood and wanted to speak to me to bring condemnation on me of failure and, and that the Word of God is not working. The Word is not working. You know, you believe the Word of God, but it's not working. And I remember one time that I actually said to God that, Lord, I, I know I'm preaching in a lot of revival meetings and I'm always saying how great God is, but unless you change something in my heart or in, in, in our situations and circumstances, I have to stop saying that because what I'm experiencing is not a great Christian experience. It's not the experience of living a life of abundance like your word says and about joy and overflowing joy. I, you have to do something in my life or I will always, I will have to stop that message because I'm actually not saying the truth experientially. And so I, uh, I was driving and the Lord, at that point, I, I, sometimes when we are so weakened down, we ask the Lord for a verse or, or word. But we have always been warned, don't just open your Bible, because that's not the way you do. That's like testing God. That's what I heard from young on up. And, but I was so desperate. I said, God, I'm so desperate, and I don't know how to, how to get, get a word. Remember now, there is, I was not taught what you all have been taught. I've not, I've, I was not taught about the workings of the Holy Spirit. I was just starting to walk in it and not understanding it. And the majority of people that were around me were people that told me that I am completely on a wrong path. So those were giants. They were huge and very intimidating to me. And, and sometimes I thought, well, am I completely on a wrong track? Because God cannot bless me. And then it was at that point where I just said, God, and I, re I reached out and said, I've got to have a word from you because I'm in the middle of some very huge decisions that have to be made. And I just ask you to open the Bible and allow me to see the word that you want me to see. And this is the exact Bible, the very verses I'm reading here is what opened to me. It says, be glad then ye children of Zion. That's the last thing I could be because it was so severe. And rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moder moderately. And I was aware that there was a lot of people being changed, and there was a lot of that going on. Uh, I was a very busy man uh, just helping people, and it was a rain that was coming down. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month, and the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the canker worm, the locust, oh, I'm sorry, restore to you the year that the locust has eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army, which I send among you. 
And ye shall eat in plenty. Remember, we didn't have, have plenty. Didn't have plenty to eat. Uh, and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And I was ashamed up until this time. I even told the Lord that. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and that none else in my people shall never be ashamed. And then it continues and says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and so forth. And I took that verse and I, <laughs> I wrote down here on a side note, after many years of trouble and, and severe hardship, the Lord gave me this promise and he has kept it completely. Now, there were giants enough in the land at that moment and that time, in those valleys that I was walking through, that could have robbed me from these verses. They could have pulled all those verses away from me and said, that is not for you. It's for everyone else, but it's not for you. And then I, <clears throat> but then the word of the Lord was strong enough in my heart that it convinced me that I am to believe this and that I am to confess this before him. And I started confessing that, God, you've given me those verses, and I just ask that you might bring that about. I don't know how you'll do it. I don't even know how you can do it. But you have given me those verses because it was miraculous how you've given me. There was no question. He gave me those specific verses, and I clung to them. And it was within a year that I saw an absolute turnaround. It was an absolute turnaround that was starting to be phenomenal. And it's been that way from that point on. Now, why am I saying that? I'm saying that as a foundation for what I believe that God is wanting to do. Milk and honey. When the children of Israel were in slavery, remember that God sent them into Egypt. And I'm not going to go into the purpose of why he sent them there, but I have quite a clear understanding of why he sent them into Egypt first. But then to bring them out again. And then they were walk or living as slaves. They were absolutely slaves uh, by the Egyptian people. And so that means that what Egypt had, and the power that Egypt had, the resources that Egypt had, the traditions that Egypt had, they tried to influence that upon the children of Israel. And so that the children of Israel would have to almost like become Egypt, and yet they were by root a completely different people. And so God says at one point that he wants to take the people out of here now. And he looked to one man by the name of Moses to do this. And Moses was willing enough because God had some kind of a calling on him because he was a Hebrew and he was, remember how he was found in a little basket when all the little boys were being killed? He was found in a little basket and ended up in the king's house, in Pharaoh's house, and then God brought him out of that. And he wanted to use him to deliver these million, maybe several million people out of Egypt. An impossible task. And he tried, Moses tried to do it with a whip. He tried to beat on one man that was hard on one of his fellows. And then he killed him. And he kind of hit him in the sand. And then as a result of that, to evade punishment, he ran into basically what we know today as Saudi Arabia. And there he was in Mount Horeb and so forth, the mountain of God. There he was for 40 years that God prepared him so that he could be the leader of the group that he is wanting to send into another place, into another territory. Now, this place that he told them that they will be going to, and if you can, I think there's quite a number of you have been to Israel, and you've seen how dry it is in that southern area. There is no grass, nothing. It's just solid desert sand, and it's extremely hot this time of the year. And in Egypt, the same way, I've been to Egypt. My wife and I, we've seen what Egypt was like. It is almost, it's just as extreme, if not even more, were it not for the Nile River. And so in that condition, God speaks to them and says that I will walk you out of here in about four days. You'll be over into a, another land. And this land is one 
that you will not have, have uh, that you will not be under slavery. You will not be beat up. You will not. You will be able to be free, and you will also conquer cities. And there is big cities there, and they're walled cities. And when we say big, not to today's conditions, but to their conditions back then, there were cities, and they were strong, and they were fortified as a whole. And so, when an enemy comes close to them, they try to go out and fight them, and to gain uh, personnel. So if they would fight something, they would fight a company of people, they would basically take them, take them captive, and now they're on their side. This is how Egypt grew into being the most powerful nation on earth at that time. Because they conquered everywhere they went. And much could be said about that, and you've heard me speak on some of those things before. But now what I want to look at is, a, is one of my favorite verses that has been a tremendous life changer for me. And you'll probably hear it, and you'll say, oh, yeah, I've heard that many, many times. But have you received it? The children of Israel were in the desert for 40 years, going in a circle. Does that describe you? Does that describe you? Going in a circle. Not getting anywhere, just going in a circle. If, if, if that describes you, you need to look at what God was trying to do to the children of Israel through this time so you perceive an understanding of what God is trying to say. And I believe those were the early parts of my walk in faith that God wanted to establish faith in me to show me and to lead me into a place where faith is my number one tool. Not the sweat of my brow, which there's nothing wrong with that, but that faith. Faith is what we walk in. Faith is how we work. We don't sit back. We, we show our faith by our works. We have, we have both of that. There is a balance. But what God led me into was this truth about milk and honey. He says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, And he humbled thee, and he suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Didn't even know what they were eating. They just, it came out of somewhere because God was taking care of them. But in the midst of God taking care of them, and after 40 years of walking in the same shoes without them wearing out, also there was nobody sick. He kept them healthy for all those 40 years going in a circle in a desert. And somehow they could not see the hand of God in that protection. They could not somehow not see that God was with them. That several million people for 40 years were surviving in a desert that grew nothing. And somehow they could not see God in that picture. And then when God said now uh, to Moses, he said, send spies over into this land where I'm going to send you to, and we, I want a report of what they see. And so we, out, out of those 12 people, t uh, uh, spies, captains, 10 came back, and they had a report that there are giants in there, and they're so fierce, and they're so strong, and they're so intimidating that we can never do it. And so the children of Israel started crying. And they all believed. And they made a fuss so big that God said, okay, you can have it your way. And so what happened, those people that were crying and those people that would not believe what God had prepared for them, every last one of them did not make it except Joshua and Caleb. They did not make it into that land because they believed a report about giants that existed, that were greater and bigger and more powerful than the God they supposedly trusted in. All the exception of two people. So what happened then as a result is they went in circles in the wilderness. And this is what this word says then. He fed you with manna that you didn't know, Neither did your fathers know, that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only, but by, the, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. I told a man that stopped by uh, yesterday as I was on the side of the road, and he thanked me, somebody not, not from this church, from the community, and he said, you've told me this some time ago, to never forget this word. He said, for all the important words that that." you spoke to me in, in a counseling thing, 
you told me there's one thing I don't ever want you to forget. And then that was this verse. And he said, this is the verse that I'm living on. And there's another one in the New Testament like it. That man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So what we have to be, remember last Sunday I was talking about why some people receive the word of God and others do not. And sit in a service just like this and someone receives a word and the word applies and they believe it by faith and some things happen. And another one sits there and hears the same thing and might be half asleep or even sleeping, does not see that it's the word of God that is coming forth to save them from circumstances, from situations, from places where they'll be walking in in the future, for places they are at presently. This is how God deals with us. He comes to us by His Word. And so we need to be very attentive when God's Word is spoken. Because God's Word... See, this is not the typical religion that we've been brought up in. We've been brought up in that this next session of our, um, our service today is going to be a boring one. Because somebody has to, under duty, stand up and say some words and talk a little bit about Jesus and it's time to go home and eat. But I noticed in the early years of my life that it doesn't, it's not this way. I noticed in those early years that after I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit that I noticed that God speaks to me. Maybe not every word, but there's nuggets that He takes, that He gives me, and I add faith to it, and it happens. I noticed that. It was different. And so I was very keen and always trying to hear what God is saying. What is God saying? Now, what happens often is when there's giants, and some of that can be preconceived giants that you have in your heart today, that'll try to rob everything that comes across this pulpit. It will say that, yeah, but your circumstance and your situation is far greater than what the Word of God is. And so you block it out as though God hasn't said it to you. I remember those times when I struggled, even for years, sitting under messages, and I I think, well, is this for me now or isn't it for me? And almost like it was an art to try to find out, God, are you saying to me, was that for me or is this for someone else? Until God gave me a faith that, no, what is being spoken is spoken to me and I can take that by faith and it will actually happen. So I do not go through that anymore where I sit, Lord, is that for me or isn't it for me? Or, Lord, is that? No, if it's the word of God, I live by it. What has happened then, because of believing the Word of God, it revolutionized my life completely. And, and if I can and simply say this, and I don't like to talk much about it, but all my successes, which has been, uh, how should I say this? All my business success is all hinged on what happened there in Joel. It's all based on that. And you cannot argue that. I'm a man that in the fifth grade has flunked. The fifth grade and had 27 Fs in that that class. I'm an unlearned man. And somehow something happened. What is it? Was it my right doing? Was it my intellectual value? Was it any of that? No, it wasn't. It was the blessing of God believed. It was the word of God received. And as a result of that, God gave me wisdom that comes from above and changed and revolutionized my entire life. It's an amazing story. And I'm, I'm not saying this for any other reason but to look at the word milk and honey. This is what God had promised. Now, how do we get milk and honey? See, a lot of people think that milk and honey is a mountaintop experience. That we come to a place from a dry place into another place, and now we're over the head, now we're over the hill, so-called, and everything will start going better. That is not what happened when the children of Israel came into Canaan. When they came into the promised land, or the land that was promised to them, it was quite another story. They were continually bombarded by giants and enemies. 
And that's the message today. Milk and honey flows. It can flow your way, but it can also flow away. Milk and honey is flowing here. But there's enemies in the midst of this, and there's an encampment of seven different tribes, specifically speaking about six today. I would have liked to go into great detail and identify all these different enemies and giants that were from these different cities. And I have. I have studied di diligently into this and looked and identified the names and what they mean. And I don't know that I can... Uh, uh, that there is enough time, there isn't enough time in one message to lay out every last detail about where the generations stem from or where the roots of some of these people come from to identify exactly what kind of an influence they had in the land of Canaan or in the promised land. So I will simply read these things to you and come up with and tell you my conclusions of what I have seen here. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large land, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites. And before I start naming these, I want to just back up a little bit. Remember that it says that uh, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Now remember where they came from in Saudi Arabia now, and being under the slavery and being fed with manna and all this, to think of even having bees that would produce honey is not even in the, even in the picture because there is no flowers. And to also think where there would be cows that couldn't be milked to have dairy is completely out because there is no grass for them to eat. Now he's talking about, I'll lead you into a place where the final product is going to be milk and the final product is going to be honey. So when you look at the planes of what it takes for that to be produced, it's quite a contrast for what they knew. All they knew was desert. So the first thing that occurs to them is there's an absolute impossibility. Where we are and what we know is nothing and it's impossible and for us to go there. Besides that, what will we do even if we would get to that land? There is so many giants there and so many enemies there that they would rob us and kill us and destroy us where milk and honey would never be received by us. So let's not attempt it. Let's stay back and let's stay away. Let's stay away from this life of faith where it takes faith to overcome it's a dangerous place. It looks awfully dangerous. Now, let's remember also that it says that man does not live by bread only. There is some things that man makes, but it's not bread only. Bread is something that is made. It's not bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Having a, a twofold suggestion here. Now I will look at these enemies that were ruling in Canaan. It says the Canaanites, they were the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites or Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites. These are six enemies where milk and honey flows. And it would almost have to be a series of messages. You could spend one message on one of these names. But if I conclude... The picture that I saw in this whole thing with all these different ites is kind of what I will try to do. Remember that they're in here to battle. There was a battle for them to receive the milk and the honey. And where there is a victory, there's always a battle. You will never have a victory without a battle. For some reason, we think and want to gear our minds to think that this Christian life has no battles, that it should be an automatic flow from heaven right into us, and there is no battle. Yes, there are battles. And these battles are designed. They're designed to be there so that honey and milk doesn't come to you without faith. Because it's a spiritual process. With every achievement, also there is a challenge. 
We like achievement, but we don't like the challenge to achieve. And to eat from a spiritual table and to be in, in a spiritual condition where God can, can use his word to take care of us is an absolute challenge. And for that challenge, there has to be certain achievements. One of the things that the children of Israel missed, so much to the point where God had to let them all die off, that all those people that hurt the opportunity of going into this land of promise, he had to let them all die so that none of them would enter into that promised land because of things they said, because of things that came out of their mouth. They believed the report of the, one, of the, of the spies that did not have faith. And I'm, I'm just going to allow this to be an individual challenge to all of us. That what God is saying and what God says to you, what His Word is saying, is absolute truth. And you will always have someone. It can be a man of the world. It can be a religious man. It can be a family man. It can be a brother, a sister, a child. Whoever. You will always have the opportunity to disbelieve the Word of God. You will always have this moment because now we're in the middle of a battle. There are cities and encampments around us. And these cities that are around us in this land that flows with milk and honey, we, we understand them. And we basically took them and, and called them one large big word, and we call it the world. And everything is the world. And so the world this and the world that and the world that. But define what that is. This is what I see in these enemies that had to be conquered and had to be driven out. And some of these, like the Canaanites, for instance, they had, when you study them and you look, and some of these things have the very name of Canaanite, means the very words that I'm going to, to conclude with. That is the word meaning, not in every case here. But the Canaanites had a mindset of superiority, that you do not come close to our encampment, an encampment because we are the best of the best. We are better than their walls were better, their gear was better, everything was better that they had. So it looked like, if you think about coming into Canaan and especially the land of Cana or the very city of it, it looked like a really impossibility to even try to destroy them because you were so intimidated. There was this constant intimidation that came because of it. One of it because they were very wealthy merchants. And they dealt with a lot of people. There's a lot of people that bought and sold. So they had a, a certain kind of friendship by way of financial control on those people. And they were very independent though. But the final conclusion of that whole picture, and I couldn't frame it any better, was they had a monstrous, uh, it was, they were the descendants of Ham, but they had a, a monstrous um, uh, name to themselves as being, we've got it all together. Everything works for us like it should. And it basically comes down to one great big word, and, and I'm sorry to say it because it's such a word that can spread out in so many different facets, and the word is pride. They looked like one proud bunch of something because everything, they were the elitist, they were the best of the best, they were premium, they were tall people, they were not short, they were tall, they, somehow they could overrule everything. And so... Anybody that was small, and we always looked smaller than our enemy, and we are always smaller than our enemy, we would have been intimidated by it because our enemy is always larger. That's why we depend on God. See, David, look at the giant. Look at the picture. It was that he came in the name of the Lord, and the stone hit the right place. Now, now if, we, if, if I could just maybe leave that and go to the next one, who's the Hittites. And they were the descendants of C-H-E-T-S, Cheth. I believe that's how it's spelled. And I tried to do research on the descendants of Cheth to find out who they were. And they, their capital, they had a capital in Turkey, the country of Turkey. 
And this was kind of descendants of them. They had their own little, you know, the way I look and in, in the way I understand this is, is right now when we go into another country, when we're in another country, we have a lot of embassies. There is an embassy in the U, a U.S. embassy over in Russia. There is one in, you name all the countries. And then you go and you have a Mexican embassy there and you have all these embassies there. And it almost seems, if you can visualize this, that a lot of these cities that were in the land of Canaan, which was promised to Abraham, were like embassies. They were representative of something. And they were fortified strongholds. So they had their own, like we would say, embassy. You know, in, in the land, of, if I go to, let's just name something. If I go to Africa, I go to Kenya. Uh, we once slept right close to the U.S. Embassy in, in Kenya. And that was representative of that. There's some laws that a Kenyan can never overtake. They cannot. There is a sovereign law that, in, that is incorporated around the world in different countries that they can actually own some land right in the heart of a city on another person's, uh, another country's land, and it's sovereign to the point where you cannot invade it. You can't even close. You can, you can be absolutely at war, but you cannot get in there. It's honored and it's understood. This is a little bit the picture I get from Canaan, the land of Canaan. The, the enemies had an encampment that territory that were territories that stemmed out into a lot of different countries. In this one, it was Turkey specifically. But they were in this area that God had promised to Abraham because somehow there was a promise. It was a promised land to the children of Israel. So when this land is promised, naturally you want the enemy, even before that this land was promised, you would have known that the enemy is wanting to occupy this place first. Because when God's people come, we want to stand against them. In the heavenlies, that would somewhat be the communication that Satan would not want God's people to take this and to be blessed by it with flowing milk and honey. So let's build cities in there quick. Let's form it all up and have our own individual cities. Now, when you travel to Israel now and you're over there, you can see these cities where they used to be. They're known as tells. The word Tel Aviv used to be a tell. It tells a story. And there's like one, one on top of another. They conquer. They take over. Another enemy comes in and they take them. They tear everything down and built on it. And then another enemy comes in, takes them down and builds on it. That's called a tell. So this is what the cities look like over there. Now, so when you look at these things, there's a lot of history. And there is this idea uh, even to this day, to take down those things that belong to God. And so there is fortifications that are against. This is part of the reason that there is such an unrest in the Middle East, and specifically in Israel, because God had promised that land to the children of Israel. And for some reason, that promise is a promise. Now, uh, the word that best describes the Hittites is fear. What they did is they induced fear. There was something very fearful about them. Their connection to Turkey, it was, uh, they were just, they were giants too. They were very tall and they're described that way as giants. And what they brought is a lot of confusion and a lot of discouragement. And remember, fear is always a liar. Fear is always a liar. Fear never says the truth because God is not fear. Fear comes from the enemy. The enemy cannot be truthful. So fear is always a liar. So what this enemy encampment tried to do is make people fear. And when they fear, they stay away. Now remember, this is in the middle of having a, a, being in a land flows, that flows with milk and honey. You have this, mo this movement over here, this city that is, in camp, that is set against you, to put fear in you that you do not try to drive it out. Now, when you can take that in a personal way, how many of you struggle with fear? There's quite a number of you that I even personally know that struggle with fear at times. That is a city that is built against you and it is designed to make you fear. 
But in the midst of that is where we get our milk and honey. Not necessarily out of that, but in the midst of it. Let's not have the mentality that when all those things are gone, now we can have milk and honey. No. This is what it looks like. We are to overcome those fear, those giants of fear. In the overcoming of those giants of fear is also in the midst of where I will have my milk and honey. Because it's a flowing land. We don't have to think that we have to drive out that whole city and once it's completely gone and completely out of there, now I can sit back and have some milk and honey. No. Part of the conquering of the enemy, that's part of, that is our victory. That's the conflict. And I would like to say that to you on a personal basis. Some of you have certain things that you will say in your heart that somehow has instilled fear in you that you would never pursue because it looks too fearful. One of those things that I would like to just bring into the picture is a calling. A calling on your life. Something that you're called to do. It looks absolutely impossible. And once... The impossibility becomes possible, now you can walk in it. Not so. Not so. In this land that flows with milk and honey, there is personal enemies that you have. Every one of you. When you're in that land, there's personal things that will occupy itself against you. You are just supposed to overcome that by faith. By believing every word that comes out of the mouth of God. That's what dismantles these cities. One night, I was asked to go to Millersburg. There was a fight that was, they're planning on having a fight in front of a certain place, and I got a call. And they didn't want to get the cops invited, so, or they didn't want to invite the cops because they didn't want to arrest. But they were planning a fight. And so a man from, a group from Kilbuck and I'm not sure why the other one, the, the, the group from Kilbug is the one that called me. And so I went out there, and I thought, oh my, I mean, there could be shooting and there could be everything going on out here, and I don't want to be involved in any of that. And then the word I was reminded of was, I go in the name of the Lord. And I went out there, and I parked my car. This was in the middle of the night, I think around 1 o'clock. And I saw the one group that... And I went out and I stood there in the name of Jesus. In the name of the Lord, I've come here. And I will ask in Jesus' name that the other group will not show up. That's exactly what happened. They never showed up, not to this day. But it was a fear monster that stood there that you could be. And you're a preacher. You shouldn't be involved in these things. And it's, it's like, oh, I mean, there was all kinds of fear. In the middle of the night, yada, yada, what could happen? But then I saw that I went by faith. This is how you conquer. I'm not doing break stories. That's not what I'm saying. That, but so that you have things to reference to. These, this is like, like how that the, the, the things that you go through that look impossible in the land that flows with milk and honey. What, what, what I'm trying to explain to you today is that it's not the idea of you're over in Egypt trying to get over here. And you're trying to drive out the enemies so that you can have milk and honey when you get there. No. We have enemies. One of those enemies is fear. It's a giant. It stares at you, intimidates you. It wants to seal up your mouth. It wants you to disbelieve God. It wants you to disbelieve His Word. This is how it works. Let's look at another one. The other one is the parasite. This one here is, they were the inhabitants of the open country. They said, it's not necessary to have walled cities around us. So they were inhabitants of the open country, and they became and were known, and this is what the name reflects, individualistic. I don't need anyone else. I'm by myself. I'm my own man. I'll do my thing. Let me think the way I want to think. You think the way you want to think. Everybody thinks the way they want to think. Leave everybody else alone. It's a little bit this thing about what we have today with acceptance of every condition that, it, that exists. 
I'm my own individual. I am this. Accept me the way I am. It's this kind of thing is what is introduced to us as what is going on in the gay movement right now. That we're to be the tolerant people, to tolerate the conditions of a sinner. We're supposed to somehow merge to their thinking so that we are even afraid to speak out. It was just like a month ago, um, there was a law in, United, uh, in, a, in Ohio that was just passed that if they caught me say what I'm about to say and what I'm saying, I could have actually ended up in a court case and in jail. But that law was just passed that I have freedom to express myself over this pulpit. That was a monster that stood there. To me, it was not a monster because I know where I stand and I know I have to preach the Word of God. But there is a thing of tolerate everything and every condition and every mixed up mess up that there is. Just tolerate. And yet the people that are promoting that to tolerate don't tolerate themselves. This is what they were known as being. Just tolerate every condition. They were unprotected and unwalled. Go to the next one, the Amorites. They were the prominent dwellers of high places. Amorites were people who were arrogant, boastful in their speech, who would challenge the lesser to make them jealous. One of the things and conditions in this realm is the monster of jealousy. Have you ever faced it? Have you ever faced it? Jealousy. Jealous of someone's appearance, jealous of someone's talents, jealous of, jealous of someone's belongings. It can be about anything. And it causes these people to make different decisions that are not based on whether what God says, but based on a response or a reaction to jealousy. Now, I think that it might not be a word that is so... Uh, dangerous to some of us? Maybe it is. Jealous is something that I think we've, it's not as big a monster as the fear one. But what jealousy can do is cause you to stumble and not do God's word, just simply you want to match up with someone else. And another thing that jealousy does, it makes you spend a lot of time in the mirror and making yourself look better than someone else. Making yourself look like really, really something that you're not. This is what jealousy does. Jealousy makes decisions that are not healthy. And when you come into this land to take milk and honey, there will be some giants there that will tempt you to jealousy. And you would just like to be like them, not what God says. See, in this land that God has given to us as a promise, which is the Christian life in, in, in the world we live in today, there is these giants. But remember, that giant stands there. I just cannot have that giant take me down. I have to go by what God says. See, others can, but you cannot. There might be somebody else that you say, well, how can that person so, so do, you know, does this, 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 this? And now you would like to fight that. You are just responding to a giant with your own flesh. And as a result, you will not be able to conquer. You will not be able to eat milk and honey that has been provided there in that land. Because your focus becomes the enemy. Your focus becomes the giant. You look at that giant and it looks everything, you get your attention, the next thing you are is you're wanting somewhat, I'm wanting to look like that, I'm wanting to be like that, I'm wanting to outdo that. And in that state, you're missing the honey and the milk that is provided for you. This is how the land of promise works. Let's go to another one. Another one is... Uh, the Hevites. They were the worldly ones. They were the, the villagers and they were the aboriginals. The enemy loved to lure into, they loved to lure the enemy into their lifestyles. And they'd even do it through prostitution and things of that nature to bring the enemy into their court and try to make them so that they mingle with them and then they've got them. Now, that's a big one. 
We're separated unto God. And we're separated to conquer. We're, we're asked to conquer in a spiritual sense the things that are enemies to the kingdom of God. But if the enemy can lure us into eating part of what is on their table, we're not, having, we're not going to have milk and honey that comes as a result of the promise of God. Because we're being affected by the giant. Remember, these giants are all, they, they set themselves as being bigger than you are. So they're all intimidating. They're all make you think that this is what you need. This is what I want. This is what I want. I want to be better than that. I want to be bigger than that. I want to be this and I want to be that. But what is God saying? What is God wanting you to be? It's part of the calling. What is the calling that God has placed on your life? That's where your contentment should surround. That which God has called you to is where you need to walk. And these other things that try to bring envy and jealousy and pride and, and, and fear in your life, you have to overcome them. They cannot let, you cannot let them overcome you. They should not be anything that you should desire after. This is something you need to diminish them. Because you're in a land where you drink and where you have plenty of milk and plenty of honey. And it's right in this territory. It's not that thing maybe tomorrow or next year. It's right now. We're in this city. We're in this, pl in, in this place, the land of promise. Because the promises of God are all yes and amen. And they're, they're that way in Christ. So they all belong to us. They're all yea and amen. The Bible says that. It's, it's, see, see, some of you people that are sitting here today, you have a giant that is sitting and standing in front of you, and you think that I could live the Christian life if it wouldn't be for that thing. That's exactly where the children of Israel were. We could get to the promised land if it wouldn't be for that one thing. That one thing that continuously stumbles you. There's one thing that stumbles you. And it stands as a giant. And you'll back off of your calling. You're surrendering to that giant. And it can be fear. Whatever it is, you well know what it is that keeps you from going forward. I could be what God wants me to be when this changes. You are to conquer that. I can be, I can walk where God has called me to if that changes. That is your job to conquer that. In the name of Jesus, you are to diminish that power and that authority that wants to hang over your head. And you stand in faith against that thing. You know what I'm talking about? Individuals in here. You're knowing exactly what I'm talking about. That's your giant. Don't let that giant prevail against you. Your calling is higher than that. And you might have to fight another 10 years and keep on fighting. You might have to fight another 20 years and keep on fighting. Keep on fighting. Keep on fighting. Because that giant cannot conquer you. But in the midst of it all, there's milk and honey flowing. Don't deny yourself from the product that surrounds you. There's blessings there. Even though that you allow those giants to come down, they're still there. But there's milk and honey there too. We eat the milk and the honey, and this is where we get our strength. We don't wait for the moment when the giants leave and then now we can, that's going to be heaven. Look at the giant in your life and speak to that giant in the name of Jesus. Tell that giant that you will not be discouraged by his appearance, by what he has spoken, by what he wants to lie into your ear. Tell that giant that you are not part of him. Tell that giant it will not make you run, but that this is your place of milk and honey. This is the place that God chooses to bless me. This is my land. This is the place where I come in that has been given to me. That place is called salvation. I stand in salvation. Giant, you have no part in salvation. I will not bow to you. I will stand against your presence. I will stand against your intimidation in the name of Jesus. And I will drink my milk and I will eat my honey. 
See, some of you, the giants have robbed your peace, and the giants have robbed your joy. Because you think they're standing there in a way that if I somehow, if that thing would be gone, then I could stand and I could worship and praise my God. Because now I could have milk and honey. No, I have milk and honey for strength on daily basis. While I face the giant of my soul. They stand there. And they want you inactive. And they want you half dead. They want to make you so that you fear them. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. These are not people. These can be evil spirits. They can, they can make themselves look like something that they're not. But they're bigger than you every time. Something big. I, if I could only have this, then my life would be blessed. Only this. Then. Remember, people, remember, you are in a land that flows with milk and honey. That's salvation. Do not just focus on those giants. Eat your honey and drink your milk. It's your strength. Know that salvation belongs to God and you walk in it. You understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to make it as practical as I can. The Hivites, they were the worldly ones. What, what, uh, uh, what a worldly giant would do is try to flash stuff in front of my eyes to get my eyes off of God. To make me desire things that the world has. That I would just, oh, I'd love to just, <clears throat> and all the things that my flesh wants. That's a giant that some people battle with. It's a giant. But remember, never forget that when you're in the middle of the giants, and they're there, that you're in a land that flows with milk and honey. See, the children of Israel wouldn't even allow themselves to get to that place of salvation. They just said, the giants are too big. We're not even getting on that land. So they stayed away. And God had to die them off and bring the young generation in. And then they're the ones that overcame them. The last one I'll talk about is the Jebusites. They were the inhabitant of Jebus. They trod on others and polluted them. They were known as the polluters. And they, they, they tried to do it specifically through intermarriage and things of this nature, religiously and then also sexually. We have a lot of sexual molestation. How, much, how many of you have been abused as a child? And I speak to you uh, that are watching as well. You've been abused as a child, and as a result, you always feel there's some, or you've messed up something sexually, that you always feel you'll never be able to be what someone else is or what you could be. I had a, a man sitting in our audience here. He was not sexually molested, but he was, he was, um, he was very, he br was brought up in a very abusive home. And he said it was just like, I'm thinking the last month, there was the first time he walked into a place for the first time that he didn't feel intimidated. And it all had to do about his past. That's a giant. Giants cannot rule you like that because you are saved. Salvation is something you walk in. That is, that is our land. If you focus on that which, has, which you have messed up and you attach your name onto that, you will not have much honey and much milk because your focus is the giant. And that giant, he whacked at you, and you yielded. Sometimes it was innocently. Other times it was something that you have done. I have sinned. You have sinned. Is there anyone here that hasn't? Jesus even said it to people that weren't saved. Is there anybody here that hasn't sinned? Let him cast the first stone. We're not weighing sins, which one did the worst and which one did the least. Sins are sins. But if you allow that sin to be thrown at you as a giant would, would to somehow overcome you, 
It will be your focus. And you'll walk around with sadness thinking that you've messed up your life or you've done something that you will never be different. You will always stand out as being that person that did that or that did this. And so what we do is we just shrivel up like a giant would shrivel us up into dormancy where there is not a lot of peace. There is not a lot of power because our focus now has become on us and our failure, not on the one that has triumphed. And the one that has triumphed is Jesus. You see, without Christ, we're all terrible sinners. So our focus is Jesus. We live and we walk in this land that has milk and honey. It's here. Whatever you're facing today, let no giant be greater, so great that you cannot eat of the blessing of God. It will not be the thing tomorrow. It will not be the thing next week that when you get over a certain hill then or a certain mountaintop, now all will be well. All is well. That's what God says. Walk in faith. Walk in what God has spoken to you. Walk in what the Word says. And let not the giant in your life, in your family, in your home, in your business, where you work, let not a giant ruin your life. You'll have them. And they'll all look big. This is the land that flows with milk and honey. For some reason, we're always waiting and thinking that that will all be wiped away and then all it'll just be some blessed moment and time where there's no more temptation, no more enemies that try to overcome us. And oh, I'm finally at the place where I want to be. That's called heaven. But when we're here, we have this. And I would like to, if I could even say this to you, I would, I would like to say, take personal interest in the giant that stands before you. Take some interest. What is he trying to suggest? Why am I so doomed being around here? It's like he spits on me when he talks. He, he views me as a, no, in salvation. I am a conqueror. I am much more than a conqueror. That's who I am. That's who I am. Eugene, that's who you are. You're more than a conqueror. Don't let no devil tell you different. I picked your name because it was on my heart to say. There's things in your heart issues. It's a giant. Take your milk and honey. It's here. He has provided for this. This is what it is. And in this, God is tremendously glorified that if these giants stand in front of us and they, they want to just make us cringe, that God is glorified. When we can go right on and still have an expression of joy. This is what I say when in worship that is so powerful. Because uh, God showed me this one night, that the head is in heaven at the throne and his feet are here, we're the body. And so when I worship him and when I praise him, it goes through all the clouds of darkness, all the giants and all the enemies that try to get me. And it goes right up through and they can't but... I don't like that. I don't like when he worships and praises God. I don't like that worship to come up to God. You see what I'm saying? It's a tremendous victory call from the earth to heaven to just praise our God. Lord, I praise you. I bless you. I praise your name. I mean, there's no devil that can get that. You're not talking to demons. You're not talking to problems that you've had. You've not talked to temptations that you've had, things that you've yielded in, things that have complicated your life. You're not speaking to it. You're speaking right into heaven. I worship you and I praise you, Jesus at the throne. And it comes from the earth. 
in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the giant. Do you see the light? I want you to eat the honey and the milk that is in salvation. Oh, we can get so occupied, preoccupied by the size of that giant that we forget to eat the honey and, and, and the milk because we think it doesn't belong to us. People, it belongs to us. It has been given to us. He has, he has cited that to us. He said, this is yours. Joy, abundance, overflowing, all those things. Well, but then why, why do I have so much trouble and problems? Because you're in the land of promise. Once you're in heaven, it's a different story. But here we have that. This is what we conquer. We conquer these giants. We subdue them. Do you kill them? Not necessarily. They stand right up because if I can say they're demonized. They're controlled by devils. And the devil is out to get God's people. So they're trying to bombard you. Now I'll say this, that I've noticed in my personal experience that when you overcome for an extended period of time, over and over and over, finally, seemingly, that thing kind of leaves you. For it's not as strong anymore. That's just, that's just my experience. So we're more than conquerors. You are more than conquerors. Do, do you understand it? I'm trying to keep it simple. I'm, I'm, I've went much longer than I was planning on. In Joshua 5, 6, I'll just read this verse yet, and then if the worship team would come up and have a closing song. For the children of Israel walked 40 days in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord unto whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord swore unto their fathers that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. When Jesus came out of the wilderness, he came out of the wilderness, he was tempted by the giants. Or that case, it was the devil himself, but giants. And the giant basically told him to do some things that God hadn't ordered. And he concluded to them, uh, to the giants, that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that's the plateau that you and I walk on. We walk on the plateau that God has made for us. It's called salvation. It's a rock. We walk on that rock. And I, I just, I, I, I just, I saw this so clearly, and I just want to say it again, people. In the midst of fighting the giants, which you will always do, they will be here. You always do. You need to give adequate attention to your diet. And that diet is, you need milk and honey. Milk gives strength and honey gives sweetness. God wants you to stay sweet. In the midst of a grimness of a trial, He wants you to stay sweet. He gives you honey for that. And He gives you milk for strength. Stay sweet. Stay sweet. I know sometimes trials are so brutal. They're so difficult sometimes, but stay sweet. There's honey and milk in the place where God has prepared for you. Take the time to eat it. Take the time to drink it. That's the purpose of it. Stay sweet. Stay sweet. Giants don't like that. They're not eating milk and honey because salvation doesn't belong to them. We eat the milk and the honey. We walk in strength and we stay sweet. That's easy said, I know. And there's times when, when, when if, if you look at things and, and all at once it's like, oh God, I can't. And you just feel so sour about everything. You need, you need to take some more honey. You may be sweet. You may smile. You may lift your hands. Yeah, but God, uh, I'm just looking at what just happened here in my life. It, it looks, oh, how can I do that? No, just do that. Just worship Him. Just bless Him. Just smile. Be sweet. You may do that. Do you hear me? Amen. What that does, what honey actually does, it makes you immune to a lot of diseases that fly around. And if you stay sweet, it'll do the same thing. Stay sweet in the middle of the trial 
the problem, the giants in your life. Stay sweet. It'll make you more immune to where it doesn't affect you as much. Isn't that pretty much what we read in the book of Psalms? He lifted up his hands again and worshipped and praised God. Why? He's talking about his enemies. But then he's worshipping God again. He was staying sweet in the midst of the pressure he was in. Now, it's easy for me to say that. I've gone through seasons that I couldn't do that. But I hope that after today, that God, or after God showed me this, that, that I can remember this, that in the middle of trials, in the middle of hard times, in the middle of giants, to always take the adequate time to stay sweet before God and before the people, and to also take great courage because of the milk that is flowing. Amen? Out of milk you make cheese. Cheese has a lot of protein, gives a lot of strength. And you go on. And that combination between milk, cheese, and sweet, carbs, what do you have? A tremendous balance. God wants you to stay balanced in the midst of the fight, in the midst of your personal things that come against you. He wants you to stay in a certain balance. And you can if you take the adequate food that is there for you. Don't wait until the giants are all laying down in the fields because that's not what's going to happen. You're, you're, you will prevail against them in the name of Jesus. They'll stand there again the next day and they'll try to subdue you, but you will not allow that. Stay sweet and stay strengthened. God bless you.